Welcome to worship at the United Methodist Church of the Resurrection. My name is Scott Crosstech, and I'm one of the pastors on staff here. And I'm Ashlyn Morgan Kirk. I'm our online connection and care pastor. It is great to have you here with us. We are so grateful that you have decided this to be where you have an encounter with God in worship. It just means a lot to us that you've chosen, of all the things you could be doing, to be present with us today uh, for worship. So thank you. And as we anticipate uh, worship, uh, it's also important to acknowledge like where we are in the rhythm of our weekly life and uh, and in the middle of the calendar. And one of the things that we are so excited about here at Church of the Resurrection is that next week is one of the best weeks of the year. It's Vacation Bible Camp Week. It's a week where we're going to have elementary school kids across all of the metro at each one of our physical locations gathering together under the banner of Hero University, Hero U, where we're going to be growing and in, in really understanding what it means to be a hero uh, in our faith, to be like Jesus, to, to live like Jesus in a way that changes the world. And so we are so excited for that, which is happening starting this next week. Uh, but we're here for worship. And before we get too far into uh, our announcements and things that we want to share with you, one of the things that we'd love for you to do is to go and visit a website called core.org slash next. And that is a landing space where you can get connected. Uh, you can find out all that's going on here in the life of our church across all of its locations and online. It's also a place for you to, to sign up for like Pastor Adam's uh, weekly e-note where he talks about faith and life and in this community. So make sure you go to core.org slash next. While you're there, before you look all around, make sure you let us know that you're there. Register your attendance. Tell us that you're here. And, uh, and that's one of the best ways just to get connected here into everything that's going on. One of the things that's going on, uh, Ashley, you want to share about, so I'm going to let you I do. Over. I am so excited about all the things that we're doing across all locations, including online, for our kind of summer of connection. I mean, we're calling it core.org slash summer, but the point of it is connection. So if you've ever felt like, hey, I wish I knew more people at church, or I wish I just knew someone around me who worshiped with me online. Well, this is an opportunity this summer, the whole summer, to become more connected and get to know, I think, soon to be friends. So there are a few things that I wanna share with you that are upcoming. So the first one is a virtual lobby chat that's gonna be happening on Sunday. July 24th, and we're gonna have that between services. And it's just short, 30 minute window, and it's kind of just say, hey, I, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about who we are and where we're worshiping from. And we're gonna, we're gonna do some fun uh, get to know you questions. I am going to make it very um, socially fun, but a little awkward, right? Like force it to say, hey, here's who I am. Like questions like, what is your, I don't know, favorite restaurant ever or your favorite food Just ever? For the record, am I answering any of these questions? I feel right like now? I feel like you could answer some. Like maybe one. What's your favorite like Kansas City? My favorite Kansas City restaurant? restaurant. Oh that's a, that's a lot of pressure. Okay, we'll yeah. think about it and we'll come back. Yeah. So then we're also doing a speed friending event. You heard me right, speed friending. So it's taking the format of you know, speed dating, but we're going, the The goal is to be friends. And so we're going to do this on Zoom. It's going to be super fun again. This sounds amazing. Yeah, it's gonna, <laughs> it's ridiculous and people have loved hearing about it. So I know that it's going to be a lot of fun and that's going to be on Sunday, uh, July 31st. And we want to make sure that you're a part of those things. I want to tell you about one more thing as well. So Resurrection Online has started a new Facebook page. We're just kind of getting people in to like it and, and follow along. And this is a great way for us to connect as an online community and also for us to do some fun stuff. So we're doing, I'm, I'm posting tractors and anybody who wants to tag Resurrection Online with a tractor that you found in the wild, which I found many in the wild this week. I can't wait to, to post them. Um, if you have your own tractor, if a friend has a tractor, tag us, we would love to repost it. But also make sure that you go to Resurrection Online uh, on Facebook and like the page so we can uh, be in community together. But all those things that I told you about can be found at quarter door slash next. You might be wondering why she wants you to post pictures of tractors. Uh, and yes. that's because we're in the middle of a God and Tractors uh, <laughs> sermon series where we're talking about tractors as an illustration of, You're right. of, of it our wasn't faith. obvious and um yeah so tractors in the yeah, wild uh, yeah. this is something that we should be posting uh but before you go on facebook you have to stay connected to core.org slash next because there's so many more things that are happening uh you know all across uh our ministry areas and one of the things that we want to draw attention to in addition to our online opportunities is something that's happening uh this august august 26th through the 28th we're having an 
in-person men's retreat, uh, you know, out at a campground, uh, which is more than a campground. It's actually a resort. Uh, it's a, yeah, it's a yeah. resort. <laughs> no, it's like a, but you know, we had to call it a camp, your know, retreat, but it's uh, at, uh, at Clearwater Cove. Uh, at Table Rock Lake. It's going to be this awesome event where guys can come, they can get unplugged, they can uh, relax, they can connect, they can grow in their faith, but they can also grow in, in friendship. And so we would love for you to consider that if that's something you're interested in. You can come from all over to meet at this retreat that's going to be taking place in August. So please uh, consider signing up. You can find out more information on that at core.org slash next. I'm excited for this. I realize I, I can't come, but I will hype it yeah, it's because gonna be it's going to be great, especially the, the resort. Part. Oh, yeah. I think that that's that's really great. Good time um, I want to remind you about something we've been sharing that's coming up, and it is on July 27th. It's a conversation about faith and abortion. This is really important for us to come together, and it's set aside in the evening uh, here at the Leewood Sanctuary in Kansas City, but it's also going to be live streamed online for anybody. Um, so there's going to be a couple of things going on. Pastor Adam's going to talk about the Bible and how this, um, how scripture speaks to this. Um, he's also going to have several guests with him. So Resurrection Women from medical and legal professions will be there as well. This is going to be really important and something you won't want to miss, 30. Yeah, it's a Wednesday night and it's online, also in person. Yeah. And, uh, and this is just a really important dialogue. I don't, I don't know, Ashley, about your experience, but for me, uh, the weekend after the Supreme Court made its ruling, we were in worship together. And, you know, as a pastor walking through the church, uh, I had people coming up to me uh, who are angry and, and frustrated and, and afraid. Uh, and then I had people coming up to me who are celebratory and excited and, and really, you know, hope filled. And so we know that this uh, topic, it cuts down the middle. And, uh, and we have people in our congregation, online, everywhere, uh, who have different views. And so we're going to come together to talk about this topic and to do so with empathy and grace mm -hmm. and, and to do so as we build community together. So please tune in. Invite your friends to tune in as well. If there's people that you know that are passionate about this, make sure that they're a part of this conversation. It's going to be a really uh, important one. Uh, also, something that's very important is what you're here for, which is worship. And so so as we kind of transition, uh, one of the things we'd love for you to do as we prepare our hearts and our minds for worship today is, uh, is to go ahead and prepare your space. And we found some helpful ways that you can do that. One of them is by lighting a candle if you have one and placing it wherever it is that you might be so your space could become a sacred space. Um, you can also grab a Bible if you want to grab a Bible and, and you can read along with Pastor Adam as he's walking us through uh, several passages this weekend on the power of the Holy Spirit. And, uh, and then we'll have an, another opportunity to, if you want to take notes, to either get your phone ready to screenshot things or you can uh, have a pad, uh, a paper and a pen so you can jot down whatever it is that God has for you today. Uh, we expect that you're going to meet God in worship. And so as we prepare for that now, uh, let's just start to turn our attention as we worship God together.
all the mountains from the seas And breathe the breath of life into dust Praise the Father, praise the Son Praise the Spirit, three in one Oh, sing hallelujah Welcome to the United Methodist Church of the Resurrection. My name is Adam Hamilton. I'm the senior pastor here, and we're so glad you're joining us for worship today. It's going to be a great weekend of worship, beautiful music. Uh, I believe you'll find the message will be powerful. Our times of prayer will be important, and I think you're going to leave changed or on the path towards, towards real change to experiencing the power of the Christian life as you're joining us for worship today. I wanna encourage you to do a couple of things. Would you grab a Bible? There's a a certain point where I'm gonna invite you to turn to Romans chapter eight. So you might already go ahead and flip to Romans chapter eight and leave it open there. Uh, So have a Bible, have pen and paper handy to write down what you wanna remember and reflect upon. And if you have a candle, have access to a candle, go ahead and have it and light it. That's a reminder that you're not just watching church, you are worshiping God. And that candle is a reminder that God is in your midst and wherever you are, that is your sanctuary. It's gonna be a great service of worship. And I'd like to invite you to bow with me now for our gathering prayer. O God, the Holy Spirit, come to us and among us. Come as the wind and cleanse us. Come as the fire and burn. Come as the dew and refresh. Convict, convert, and consecrate many hearts and lives to our great good and to thy greater glory. And this we ask for in Jesus' name, amen.
as we continue in worship, we do so in a spirit of prayer. And today I've been thinking, I've been working on my computer a whole lot and keep using that little button that says need help, click here. And so as I think about prayer, I think about what it means to need help, to ask for help from our God who loves us, who knows us by name, And I don't know what kind of people you're surrounded with in your life, but there are lots of helpers out there, but no one compares to God who is our present help today and every day to come. And so we go to that God in prayer. Would you join me in prayer? Holy and loving God, we thank you that you are a steady and true presence in our life that we can trust. God, our lives are complicated. They are messy. They are filled with questions and discernment and attempts at following your will and trying to do the right thing. God, we want to be people who make an impact in this world. We want to be people who choose the loving thing to do. We want to be people whose lives are marked by our faith, by our following of your son, Jesus. And yet, for whatever reason, that can get so messy in this life. It is not always clear. And so, God, we we look to you. We pray that in these times of of prayer, in these times of worship, in these moments where we center ourselves around our faith, that you would help quiet the other voices in our lives and help us to listen for you. Because God, we need your help to be the kind of people that you have called us to be. Lord, we thank you that you have promised to forgive um, our missteps, our mistakes, our sins. And so we bring those to you now in the moment of silent confession. Hear our prayers. God, thank you for forgiving us and taking our sins as far as the East is from the West and giving us new life and and breathing um, new breath into our lungs. We are grateful for second chances and new beginnings and this revival that we are experiencing. So God, continue to lead us. Make us mindful of the the cares of this world that, that you weep with us for. Those places in this world that are broken, for those who experience war and violence and hunger and poverty. God, for those who are lost and needing direction, needing hope and healing, God, we pray your blessing upon their lives and we pray that you would use us to be ministers of hope, to be ambassadors of your love in every instance that we can so that your kingdom can come here on earth as it is in heaven through us. God, make us faithful, make us bold, Give us courage to to speak up, to act boldly, and to be yours. Be defined by your love and sharing that with everyone we meet. God, as we do that, we recommit our faith to Jesus Christ, our Lord, by praying the prayer that he taught his disciples to pray out loud together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we continue in worship, I first wanna say thank you for being here. It's an honor to be your church today. And if this is your very first time with us, we want to extend an extra warm welcome to you. But as we continue, I want to invite you to pull out your phone and go to core.org slash next. And there you can click, tell us you're here. We want to know that you're here. We're a church that cares about you. While you're there, you can submit prayer requests. There's all sorts of other things there at core.org slash next. But at this time, I wanna invite you to tell us you're here, register your attendance. And as you do that, let's continue in worship together. My name is Allie Drummond and I serve as one of the pastors here at Church of the Resurrection. And as we continue in worship together, I invite you to hear these words of scripture from the book of Acts. 
Jesus said to his disciples, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. In Romans eight, we read these words. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit that dwells in you. And in Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth, we hear, there are different spiritual gifts, but the same spirit. And there are different ministries in the same Lord. And there are different activities, but the same God who produces all of them in everyone. A demonstration of the spirit is given to each person for the common good. May God add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and understanding of scripture. <laughs> Many of you know that Church of the Resurrection is one church in multiple locations. We've got five Kansas City area locations, two on the Missouri side of Kansas City and three on the Kansas side of Kansas City. And of course, many of you join us from across the country or around the world. And I'm preaching from our Leewood location, which is just across the state line into Kansas. And uh, I got to tell you a little bit about Kansas right now. No offense to the Missouri people, because I love Missouri as well. Uh, I got family in both, both places. But you know, I got to tell you, Kansas might just have the most beautiful sunsets of anywhere in the world. And if you drive across Kansas, you'll have a chance to see the Flint Hills and they are magnificent. And the sunflower fields, you know, it's just awesome. And watching the waving grain. And of course we have Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz and a whole host of other things, including some of the nicest people on planet earth in the state of Kansas. And I know Missouri people are nice and everywhere else too, but I'm just telling you as a, as a guy who grew up in Kansas, we got some really nice people around here. But what we're best known for, at least for folks who are in the know, is producing wheat. And we are the largest source of wheat in the, in the United States. Uh, we produce annually 320 million bushels of wheat. A bushel is 9.25 gallons or 9.26 gallons. This is a bushel right here. And we produce 320 million of those, number one in the, in the United States. And, uh, and that is the equivalent of, if you take a standard loaf of bread, a pound and a half loaf of bread, that's 13 billion, 400 million loaves of bread that come out of the wheat that we produce in Kansas every single year. We know wheat. And not those of us in the city, maybe, but those of us out in the rural areas, we produce a lot of wheat. Now, uh, I want you to know that in Kansas, we have just finished the wheat harvest. So it started in the eastern part of the state and the combine teams move across to the western part of the state. And I think they're just wrapping up right now near the Colorado border. And so, uh, so a lot of wheat being produced this last month. And that tied in with this sermon series. So we're in the midst of a summer revival in which we're talking about God and tractors. And this is part of what inspired this, is this is a time not for the city dwelling folks like me and the, the folks in the, in the suburbs, but for folks outstate, a lot of tractors doing a lot of powerful work right now to feed a lot of people. And, uh, and so our summer revival, we're talking about lessons learned from God and tractors. You'll see behind me, my own tractor, that's my John Deere 3020. And there are people I know who ask when I travel to Boston or somewhere like, you know, do all of you have cows in your backyard in Kansas? No, we don't all have cows in our backyard. We got dogs and cats and, and, uh, and most people, you know, have cows live outside of the cities. And most people don't have tractors like this in the city, but I got a few acres and, and I just love tractors. And so, so anyway, you know, this is my tractor. And, and today I want to talk to you a little bit about tractors. And I want to tell you the history of tractors as a way of getting at what the Holy Spirit does in our lives. So we're gonna talk tractors first and we're gonna talk a little bit about the wheat harvest and then we're gonna go into tractors. So I wanna remind you that, you know, something we've all heard before, that, that uh, dictum that necessity is the mother of invention. And when it comes to tractors, tractors were invented because people are moving to cities and the folks living out in rural areas had to produce more food with less hands than they'd ever had before. And on less, you know, more food on, on fewer acres. I mean, they started consolidating farms, but they had to produce food for all the people who are moving to the cities. And so you had to come up with a better way of doing what you were doing before. So I want to tell you just a little bit about the, the wheat harvest. So the way it's been done from time immemorial was the use of a hand sickle. This is my great grandfather's hand sickle. And so as you're cutting the wheat, you come along and, and that cutting of the wheat, that, that cutting it down with a sharp blade was called reaping. And so, you know, the phrase, you reap what you sow. Well, uh, this in particular was reaping wheat. You had sown wheat, you're reaping wheat. And this is how you did it. You did it with a hand a sickle. Later on, you learned how to, you know, the, the, scythe, was, the scythe was invented. And, and this allows you to, to cut a lot more wheat than you could do in, uh, with just the hand sickle. And so these are all tools that helped people to be able to harvest more grain. 
So I want you to see what this looks like when it comes to harvesting grain and, and the Amish still do it this way. Many of them do. Uh, take a look. And so you see the hand sickle and, uh, and cutting out the wheat in this field. And then it's gathered together in sheaves. These are called sheaves bound together. And then they're gathered together into shooks. And then those are gathered and they are put in a threshing machine, which beats the, the, uh, the kernels off of the stalk. And then after this, the, the uh, wheat is, in this case, would be, would be thrown in a bucket up into the air. Uh, you know, and you would have, it, especially on a windy day, it would, it would blow away the chaff, all the, all the little husks around the, the wheat kernels. And what you would have left was, was wheat. And so this is a whole process. And when you think about these terms, these are all things that show up in the Bible. Again, you, know, you reap what you sow. I mean, it comes out of this kind of harvesting. The sheaves, and you may remember the old, uh, the old gospel, him bringing in the sheaves, which was about you know, Christ's return and, and the harvest, you know, harvest time. And, and the idea of, uh, of shooks, this is a picture, by the way, of shooks. Uh, and, and so these are stacks of sheaves that are bound together and, and, uh, and then they're dried waiting for harvest. And then finally, of course, we have threshing, which is the beating of the grain. And as you're beating the grain, you are, uh, you are separating it from the, the husks. And then finally, after that, you end up with winnowing. And winnowing is again, where you're separating the wheat from the chaff. So all these terms show up again and again in the Bible. But, but here's the thing. In the 19th century, people began to invent machinery that would expedite this process, that would allow a farmer to do more with less, that would give them greater power. And that started uh, with steam and steam engines. So uh, at the time in the 1800s, steam engines were invented uh, used on trains and a whole host of other things, uh, but also on the farm. Uh, wheels were set on them and they couldn't drive themselves, but they were pulled out by teams of horses and they were pulled out rocks and they were pulled out to the field. And then that belt was connected to its movement, its, its uh, pulley system, and it was hooked up to different kinds of machines like the thresher. And I saw this video this week and spoke with the guy in England who had, who had shot it. I want you to see it. This is a steam thresher. And uh, I want to thank Harry Rogers in Seven Oaks, England for allowing me to use this. So, so that machine, that steam machine was brought out by, by horses. Uh, a pulley's hooked up to the steam thresher behind it. The steam thresher then is, uh, is working to take the wheat and it's beating it to separate the kernels. And then from that, it's separating the wheat from the chaff. And then what you find left in the end, it's amazing. This is from the 1800s, if I'm not mistaken, it was modified with the tires later on. But, but what you find in the bottom is you find this, uh, you know, you find all of the grain that's there. So, so this is, you know, this suddenly uh, was able to produce with this kind of machinery, what a human couldn't do in days and days, it could be produced, you know, in, in hours. I mean, it was amazing. And then later on, they began to uh, put power drives to those steam engines and they created steam propelled tractors. This is a picture of one from the Deanna Rose Farmstead, not far from our church. And you can see in the back where the coal would be kept and, and then it would pull behind it implements. So suddenly you're able, instead of having horses pull things or oxen, you have a tractor, a, you know, a steam engine that's pulling these things. And then I want you to see the 150 horsepower case steam tractor from, eight, uh, from 1905. If you'd show that on the screen. This is amazing. Now this tractor, <clears throat> built in 1905, there are none left. This was rebuilt from the original plans, but it was able to pull, you know, I don't remember, like 18 bottom uh, plows, you know, 18 plows across a field just on the strength of that one tractor. But the thing was, those things were super heavy and they were pretty hard to operate. <clears throat> so in uh, 1892, a man named John Froelich invented uh, a gasoline powered tractor. That was gonna be a game changer. Now this is a picture of Froelich and his tractor and you stood on the front and drove it this way but it didn't need steam anymore. You didn't have to be feeding the, uh, you know, feeding the steam engine anymore. Much lighter was able to do things that the steam tractors couldn't do. It was a disaster. Uh, he sold two and I think they were both returned, um, but there were other people who picked up the idea. So in 1905, there were a pair of guys, Hart and Parr, who, who uh, actually were the first ones to coin the phrase tractor. Before that, they were uh, mechanical traction units, but they, they uh, coined the phrase tractor and they created a gas powered tractor that actually succeeded. They sold 15 of these things. Take a look. And I love looking at that. I mean, is that not astounding to see? But that was one of the first commercially successful, if not the first commercially successful tractor. And you started it with the flywheel you saw it on the side. You actually would pull that thing down to get the thing started. People would break their hands or their arms while they were trying to start these things. And then after that, so uh, Froelich went back and he with a couple of other guys started the Waterloo Gasoline Traction Engine Company. And, uh, and so they made another run at this thing and they eventually ended up making a successful product called the Waterloo Boy. And, uh, and this is the Waterloo Boy. This is an ad for the Waterloo Boy. And this, was, uh, this came out, I think, in 1913 and very successful. They ended up selling, selling hundreds, I think 800 units, maybe more than that, maybe thousands of units of this. The first really significant commercially successful gasoline tractor. And, uh, 
And this thing was kind of hard to start too. I want you to see uh, a little footage of them starting one of these Waterloo boys. Take a look. So here they go, watch the crank. And there it goes. It was amazing. So these things revolutionized tractors even further. Now they started adding implements on the back that were lighter weight, <clears throat> some that could be a little heavier, that could accomplish all kinds of things on the farm. Now there was a company that was making these implements. They'd been making them to be drawn by horses and oxen. And then they started making them to be drawn by tractors. And they decided, you know what? We need to get into the tractor business. These guys have figured something out. And so they bought the Waterloo tractor business and the tractor works and, uh, and began producing these under their own name. And their name was John Deere. And so 100 years ago, 1918, is when John Deere bought the Waterloo Boy a tractor company, and the rest, as they say, is history. Now, I, I do want to get to our sermon on the Holy Spirit, but I, I, thought I'd enjoy, I thought you might enjoy hearing from a, tra- uh, a farmer in our own community. Uh, his wife is a leader in our congregation, Catherine. Uh, Nick Guterman and his family farm thousands of acres just south of, uh, of where the church is. And, uh, and I thought you'd enjoy hearing him talk about his tractors and how tractors have changed things, and then how his tractors have changed, his family tractors have changed over time. Take a listen. Before tractors, predominantly farming was done with animals, whether horse or oxen, and then tractors come about that kind of took their place to be more productive to pull implements. So this tractor in particular is a 3020. It was had a four cylinder engine. It was a little bit smaller, more for maybe pulling a small plow or a little planter, uh, doing small yard work, pulling a little mower. The 4020, it was, this was my dad's planting tractor. He'd pull two four row planters hooked together. And then this was John Deere's workhorse, the 7520. That was used for, for tillage and, and doing big horsepower jobs. One horse would maybe pull a one bottom plow, or a team of horses would pull a two or three bottom plow, whereas this tractor here would pull uh, an eight or nine bottom plow um, with ease. So, you know, 10 times productive as an, as an individual horse. And this was actually our planting tractor right here is a John Deere model 4455. This is what we used to plant our corn from basically 1980 until the early 2000s before we transitioned to more modern day tractors, which was what we have over here. The John Deere 8R series, when this one being a 320 horsepower John Deere 8R, that it can pull a 36 row planter and also has modern day technology where it sends and shares data with the cloud so we can see real time uh, performance what this tractor is doing. I think that is astounding. I just love this stuff. And, and thinking about that tractor being able to plant 36 rows at a time, as opposed to somebody hand planting and drilling that seed into the ground. I mean, it's amazing what it's able to do in order to accomplish what tractors and farmers are meant to do. And that is feed people. That is to produce a harvest. Now, all of this talk about tractors is about pursuing power, the power to do the thing you're meant to do, the mission that you have, the power to be able to do more with less and to do what you couldn't do by yourself. And all of that takes me then to the Holy Spirit. So you might have been wondering like, you know, when is this gonna get to, you know, spiritual things? Well, here it is right here. And I want you to catch this. What tractors are to farming, the Holy Spirit is to the Christian spiritual life. So let's talk about who or what the Holy Spirit is for a moment. In the Bible, the Holy Spirit, that you'll remember, Christians see God in Trinitarian terms. We see God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Father is God. The Holy Spirit is God. The Son is God. We have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And, and it makes my brain hurt to try to fully explain that, but I just know it's true. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit is God's indwelling presence in our lives. And the Greek word in the New Testament for spirit is pneuma, from which you may uh, recognize the word pneumatic. Pneumatic is any tool that's operated by the power of, of wind or air. And the word spirit in Greek, again, the pneuma, also means breath or air or wind. It means all of those things. So it can mean spirit, breath, air, or wind. And you just look at the context to see what that means. So the Holy Spirit is the holy breath of God, the holy wind of God, the holy, you know, the air, you know, that we breathe, all of that is, is that's kind of bound up together in the Holy Spirit. In the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament, it's the same idea. Ruach is the term, ruach. And ruach is this idea, again, of spirit, wind, air, breath, all of these things are what scripture, you know, is this words, these words are what scripture is using to describe the spirit of God. And in the Old Testament, we find that the Holy Spirit was uh, primarily falling upon 
you know, people doing extraordinary things. Now, the Bible begins with God creating human beings in the Garden of Eden and he breathes on them the breath of life or into them the breath of life. The word breath, again, is spirit. It's ruach in Hebrew or in Greek, it would be pneuma. And so God is breathing the spirit into them, his spirit and, and creating the human spirit. Uh, but after that, most of what we find is the Holy Spirit is primarily in the domain of kings who are going to rule by the spirit or prophets, or, you know, there were times there were the special artisans who had particular gifts and they thought the spirit of God was upon that person to give them the gifts to be able to create beautiful things. So this is in the Hebrew Bible. But when you get to the book of Joel in the Old Testament, the prophet Joel, Joel makes this promise. He says this, uh, he says, I will pour out my spirit upon everyone. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams and your young men will see visions. What Joel foretold was realized in the New Testament. The Holy Spirit was a work in the conception of both John the Baptist and in the conception of Jesus. We find the Holy Spirit uh, coming upon Jesus in his baptism. We find he was doing these works, these powerful works of healing and uh, all by the power of the Holy Spirit. And, and then we find that Jesus promises his disciples on the night before he is arrested, or the night he's arrested, the night before he's crucified. And then later on, before he leaves them after his resurrection, he makes this promise, I'm going to send or the Father will send the Holy Spirit to you. The Holy Spirit will be your comforter, will be your guide, your counselor, or we'll teach you all things that you, know, that you need to know. We'll give you the words to say when called upon to testify. The Holy Spirit will give you, well, here's what Jesus said uh, after his resurrection. He said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. There it is, power. Those tractors were all about harnessing power in order to produce more, in order to do more of what, what farmers were trying to do. And in the case of the Holy Spirit's presence in our life, you will receive power. The Greek word is dunamis, from which we have the word dynamite, you will receive power to be God's witnesses, to be Christ's witnesses. What is a witness? Well, it's not just somebody who talks about Jesus. It's somebody who lives their life in such a way that people see a compelling picture of the kingdom of God and of Jesus. The word uh, witness in Greek is martyria, from which we have the word martyr. Somebody who's willing to lay down their life for what they believe. And so being Christ's witnesses and the power to be his witnesses is both what we say, but it's how we live our lives. And, and the Holy Spirit will empower us to do that in ways that we could not do on our own. Uh, 120 days after Jesus' uh, crucifixion and resurrection was the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem. It was the harvest day. It was about this time of year, it was uh, June. And, uh, and they, were, they were celebrating the spring harvest of the wheat and people gathered from all across the world. It was one of those festivals that Jews gathered in Jerusalem. And as they gathered there, the disciples were in a room with 120 followers of Jesus. They were still afraid to talk about Jesus publicly because Jesus had just been arrested a few weeks and crucified uh, some weeks before. But on this day, what Jesus had foretold actually happened. This is Luke, or excuse me, Acts chapter two, verses one through four. When Pentecost day arrived, they were all together in one place, Suddenly a sound from heaven like the howling of a fierce wind filled the entire house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be individual flames of fire alighting on each one of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit enabled them to speak. This wasn't kings and prophets. This was ordinary people. They were filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. It looked like flames of fire. This is another way of saying there was power in this room. The howling wind, all of this, the howling spirit breath of God was filling that place. And as they were filled with the Holy Spirit, they could not help themselves. They spilled out into the streets and they began talking about Jesus in ways they'd been afraid to do for the last six weeks. They, were, they had been afraid the last seven weeks, actually. They'd been afraid, but now they were speaking publicly about Jesus again. And they had the power to speak in languages they didn't even know. There were all these Jews from across the world who spoke other languages. They were speaking in those other languages, the good news of Jesus Christ. How did they do that? It was the power of the Holy Spirit. That day, 3,000 people became followers of Jesus. Now, when you read through the letters of Paul, you're going to find that there's a lot in there about the Holy Spirit. In fact, in the New Testament, there are over 300 references to the Holy Spirit or to the Spirit of God in the New Testament. I read every single one of them this week and listened and learned and thought, okay, how do I summarize all of this? And I, I can't even begin to summarize it, but I'm going to share with you at least a few scriptures uh, of what the Apostle Paul said about the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. So if you have your Bible, turn to Romans chapter 8. And as you turn to Romans chapter eight, I'd like to invite you to turn to, to verse 11. Now the entire eighth chapter of Romans is just filled with this, this teaching about the Holy Spirit and what the Holy Spirit does. But look at verse 11. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead, that is if the Holy Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead 
dwells in you. He who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit that dwells in you. So God, the father has, has used the spirit to raise Jesus from the dead. And if he will raise Jesus from the dead, how much more is he gonna be at work in your life, helping you overcome your mortal flesh? And this is not just about your death and being resurrected. When Jesus, or when Paul's making this argument here, he's talking about what we talked about last week, the works of the flesh, you know, the sarks, the, the things we tend to do that we shouldn't do and, and the drives and desires to do things that are unhealthy for us or, or that hurt other people. And he says, if the spirit raised Jesus from the dead, how much more can the spirit help you overcome your own mortal flesh to live the way you wanna live? I was thinking about this this week. I asked uh, people on Facebook, you know, tell me how the Holy Spirit has worked in your life. And there was a woman who described how for 40 years she'd smoked and she was trying, trying, trying to stop smoking cigarettes. And, and one day she had been praying about this and she, you know, she's in her car and she lights up another cigarette and she starts crying. Why can't I break this habit? And then she hears this voice in her car. She thought it came from the back seat and it said, do you trust me? I mean, why don't you trust me? And she looked in the back seat and there was nobody there. And, and she instantly understood that God was asking her, the, the Holy Spirit, she believed it was the Holy Spirit in that car with her, asking her, why don't you trust me to help you with this? You can't do this by yourself, but I can help you. And she said, that was the last time I ever smoked a cigarette. He just broke this power in my heart, in my mind, when I finally trusted the Holy Spirit to help me. I mean, that's what Paul's talking about here. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is at work in your body, how much more can he help you in overcoming things you cannot overcome by yourself? Look at verses 13 and 14 in chapter eight of Romans. If you live on the basis of selfishness, you're gonna die. But if by the spirit you put to death the actions of the body, you will live. And then I love this line. All who are led by God's spirit are God's sons and daughters. Don't you love that? I mean, if you're led by the spirit, if you're allowing the spirit to lead you, you are a son or a daughter of God. No matter what anybody else says about you, you are a child of God when you allow the Holy Spirit to lead you. And, and we all have the Holy Spirit. We know that. that you know, Paul says, you can't say Jesus is Lord without having the Holy Spirit. If you're in Christ, you have the Holy Spirit. The question is, just, are you opening yourself up to the Spirit's power and work in your life? Or are you trying to do it by yourself still? Like that woman was in the car after she'd prayed and prayed and prayed, but she'd never let the Holy Spirit be a part of the equation, the power of the Holy Spirit to do this. It's interesting, Paul says that the church is the body of Christ. And he also says the church, you plural, he says in one place, are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So the church is, you know, is indwelt by the Holy Spirit. But he also says in another place, you personally, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit dwells in you. The question is whether you open yourself up to that or ignore it. And, and so part of revival is opening yourself up to the work of the Holy Spirit and recognizing the Holy Spirit is working in you. Go ahead and look down. So you're a child of God. Look at verse 26. The Spirit can, comes to help our weakness. We don't know what we should pray, but the spirit himself pleads our case with unexpressed groans. Have you ever felt like you don't know what to say, what to pray? I have. And there are times where, you know, all I can do is sigh. And sometimes all I can do is cry, or sometimes I just groan before God. And, and in the charismatic and Pentecostal churches, they talk about speaking in tongues. These are, you know, it's, it's syllables that don't make any sense. There's no syntax or grammar. And, and, you know, I came out of that tradition. I know what that's like to be able to pray sometimes with you know, just to, to utter what sounds like nonsense to somebody else, but it's just pouring out your, you know, it's the spirit working in you to pour out your feelings and your heart to God and allowing you to pray with groanings too deep for words. Verse 28, I love this verse. It's one that many of you have memorized. In fact, we memorized it here at Church of the Resurrection a couple of years, last year it was, where, during our study of Romans. The spirit comes to help, no, excuse me, verse 28. We know that God works all things together for good for the ones who love God for those who are called according to his purpose. Now the Holy Spirit's not mentioned there, but this is in the context of the Holy Spirit, the whole chapter is. And so how does God work all things together for good? It's not that God forces bad things to happen to you. That's not how God works. He's not punishing you or trying to you know, force bad things to happen so something better can happen. But here's the thing, bad things happen in our lives, sometimes self-inflicted, sometimes inflicted by other people. Bad things happen sometimes in our lives. Life is hard and difficult and tragic sometimes. But what this says is that God, in the midst of those times, God forces all things to work together for your good. How does God do that? By his Holy Spirit by his Holy Spirit, by a spirit working in you, who's helping you to be able to, to cope with, to deal with whatever it is you're walking through, by the Holy Spirit working in the hearts of other people who come alongside you to help you, by the Holy Spirit, you know, uh, helping you know, form in your mind thoughts and reactions by, by comforting you and consoling you and carrying you when you don't see any way you can make it through this. And then you look back after time and you see what God did with the pain in your life. How did that happen? It was through the Holy Spirit that all of this happens, all of these beautiful promises. And then you get to the end of the chapter and you reach that dramatic climax. Listen again to these words from Romans chapter eight, verse 35 and following. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? 
Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors, more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded or convinced that neither death nor life, nor rule, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. How does that work? That when we're going through hard times, we know that we are still with Christ, that he's walking with us, that, that God has not abandoned us. It's through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. He does not abandon us. So no matter what you're walking through, even through the valley of the shadow of death, the Holy Spirit is with you. The Spirit of God is with you. Consoling, comforting, leading, guiding, forcing good to come from evil, redeeming tragedy and pain, and just promising, look, I'm not going anywhere. I'm with you. The Holy Spirit wants to do all of these things. The question is, are we opening ourselves up to the Holy Spirit's work? Are we listening? Are we paying attention? Are we inviting the Spirit to work in us? Let me just remind you of a few other things Paul teaches us about the Holy Spirit. We had a sermon series a year ago on the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, and 23. And what we learn is he uses this agricultural metaphor to say the Holy Spirit produces fruit in you as though you were a tree or a bush and you're producing this, but it's the Holy Spirit produces it for you. And so here's what we do is we invite the Holy Spirit to change us, to work inside of us. And the Holy Spirit does what we cannot do on our own. Like the woman who was smoking, there's a whole lot of things I wanna be more of, but I can't quite get there by myself, but the Holy Spirit will do this with me. And so I want you to read with me these things. I want us to say this out loud. And what you're gonna see on the screen is the scripture memory verse card that we gave you a couple of years ago. And let's say this together. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Which of us doesn't want more of that in our lives? Which of us doesn't want to be more like that? Which of us wouldn't be happier if we had all of those things in our lives? And what Paul is saying is the Holy Spirit produces that in us. What we do is we open our hearts. Like we make sure that, our, that the soil of our heart is, is, is open and ready and that we've pulled out the weeds as best we can, the stuff that shouldn't be growing there or invited him to do that for us so that we can become what he has described. Then, then there's something else he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. He says, to each is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. And here he's talking about spiritual gifts. To one is given through the spirit, the utterance of wisdom. So some people have this ability to say wise things that are, that are beyond themselves. To another, the utterance of knowledge, the ability to know things that you might not know otherwise, to, according to the same spirit. To another, faith by the same spirit, an extraordinary measure of faith. To another, gifts of healing by the one spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the discernment of spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All of these are activated by one and the same spirit who allots to each one individually as the spirit chooses. So he's saying, and this is not the only list. There's other lists in the New Testament of gifts and offices and, and, and things like these, you know, like, like this, where, the Holy, where Paul says, you know, the Holy Spirit gives you abilities you don't have on your own. And those abilities are, are, of course, to help you grow in faith, but they're also to help other people. This is why Christianity is meant to be lived in community. You know, to the degree that you're able to come to church, you, you should be together with other people because there are other people who need the gifts that you have and you have, uh, and they have gifts that you need. And so, you know, whatever gift you have, you're meant to be using that and the power of the Holy Spirit to help other people, whether it's faith or service or, or, or witness or, or generosity or, you know, there's all of these gifts in the New Testament the Holy Spirit gives us, but they're all not meant to be just kept for ourselves. They're meant to be used in service to Christ's kingdom and to bless and care for and help other people. All right, you have gifts of the Holy Spirit. I mean, above and beyond the gifts that you were just naturally endowed with, there are certain things when you open yourself up to the Holy Spirit, he gives you gifts to be able to do what you could not do on your own. Those are meant to be used for other people. When I think about this, I think about tractors again, and I think about implements. Now, implements are what you hook up to the back of the tractor, and, uh, and there's a PTO a drive at the back of the tractor that, that propels these things. And so I have a handful of implements in my barn at home. You can see them in this little video. And, you know, there's my hay wagon. And actually, that belongs to one of our members. That is, uh, that's my old uh, brush hog. There's the plow, or not the plow, but the blade that we use to push the snow in the winter and mud and stuff. There's a, a rototiller. Uh, there's the disc where you disc with this, you know, you disc the seed into the ground. On the back of my tractor, you can see there is the... Um, there is the broadcast spreader where I use to spread seed. And you know, all of these things, I mean, just think about this. Uh, this is the way I would spread seed. You know, if I was trying to do this manually, I would just, uh, you know, I just, I'd get about a quart of seed and I'd be able to spread this around. That, that uh, 
broadcast spreader on the back of my tractor, that'll hold about a thousand pounds of seed. And with my tractor, I can spread that seed over, you know, I don't know how many acres I could cover with that, but it goes by pretty fast as opposed to, you know, using one of these handheld spreaders or the old fashioned way, just scattering the seed as you go along. I mean, what all of these implements do is they unleash the power of the tractor and the gifts of the Holy Spirit unleash the power of the Holy Spirit in your life and in the lives of other people and in the church when we're all using our gifts for God's greater good and for the good of the community. That's what these implements are meant to do. All right, the Holy Spirit does for us what we cannot do for ourselves, but part of what we have to do is surrender. We invite the Holy Spirit to work in us. So I've been talking about the 12 steps and how 12 steps are really, you know, they're anchored in Christianity. They're all, Christianity is all over them, even though they don't use those same terms. And we talked about the first nine steps of AA uh, over the last couple of weeks. Today, I want to get to steps 10 and 11. Let me remind you, step 10 in the AA Uh, Alcoholics Anonymous uh, 12-step plan, we continue to take personal inventory and when we were wrong, we promptly admitted it. It's not enough to just somewhere in the past, I got right with God and right with other people. This is an ongoing continual thing that we have to do in our lives. But then I want you to notice this one. We sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power, there's that word again, the power to carry that out. I love this. We finally get to near the the end of the 12 steps, we get to the 11th step. And this is about spiritual disciplines. I'm praying, I'm meditating. I'm not only meditating upon what I have done wrong in the past, I'm meditating on what God wants me to do going forward. And I'm praying that God will help me see and have the knowledge of what that is. That's what Jesus said the Holy Spirit does. He leads you into all truth. He helps you have the knowledge of God's will in your life. And so the 11th step, I'm praying for this and I'm meditating upon this. And then I'm praying for God to give give me the power to do it. Because remember, we're powerless by ourselves to do very much. We can do some things, but with the power of the Holy Spirit, we can do a lot more. And it's really just such an interesting paradigmatic idea that what Paul says, uh, or what God says to Paul in, in one of his epistles, in your weakness, I am made strong. That's what God says to Paul. So I was reminded of something that, that Tom Langhofer, our pastor of recovery ministry said a couple of weeks ago when we interviewed him about strength and power and weakness Take a listen. What the program and the 12-step program did is it re-centered my uh, focus on Christ. Um, I surrendered, you know, and surrender was the easiest and yet probably one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. It might sound counterintuitive that you surrender and you become more powerful but that's truly what happened to me. When I turned my life over to Jesus and let him guide me and to try to follow his will and his way, I became a stronger by, by giving up control and admitting that I was powerless and admitting that I didn't have it all together and admitting that I had weaknesses, um, I became a stronger person. It's amazing how this works when we finally yield ourselves to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit makes us powerful in the moment we think we're weakest. The Holy Spirit guides and leads us, helps us to understand what we wouldn't understand on our own, prompts us and and nudges us so that we can be a part of God's will. And this is how it happens in the lives of people who are paying attention and inviting the Holy Spirit to work in their lives on a regular basis. I can't do this by myself, but I know, oh God, Holy Spirit, you can do this through me. Here I am, use me. One of the other folks who wrote on, uh, on my Facebook page about how they'd experienced the power of the Holy Spirit in their lives Uh, describe something that happens. You probably have had this happen in your life. It's the Holy Spirit. But she said, my friend Jan and my dad and I all work together. And one day I was alone in the office and I heard a voice say, Jan needs you. Then my phone rang and I answered and my dad said, Jan needs you. He was out of town. I asked if he talked to her. He said, no, I just have this feeling that Jan needs you. So she said, I rushed to the hospital where I knew Jan's husband was going through a routine, routine pacemaker procedure. And that procedure ended up going bad. And I just happened to be there when her husband died. How did she know she, you know, how did she hear that voice, Jan needs you? How did her dad hear that voice wherever he was out of town? You need to go see Jan. That's the Holy Spirit laying things on our hearts. And the key is we've got to pay attention. This happens every single week and often every day in my life where if I pay attention, the Holy Spirit will prompt me to do this or call this person or go to this place or, or I'll feel something where the Holy Spirit's speaking to me, something that I need to share with you in a sermon or something else. But if I'm paying attention, I find strength when I'm weak. I find wisdom when I feel empty and have nothing to offer. And I find myself right in the middle of what God wants me to do. 
if I'm just inviting the Holy Spirit to work in me and I'm paying attention. All right, if you want revival, if you want peace and power and hope and joy and to live unafraid, knowing that you're a child of God, what you need is the Holy Spirit. And today I'm gonna invite you to ask the Holy Spirit to lead, guide, and fill you. But before we do that, I wanna come back to the tractor and the sickle and the harvest. So I was curious, you know, how much wheat can somebody with a hand sickle harvest in a single day? You know the answer? It's a third of an acre, a third of an acre. And then you gotta let that dry and then you've gotta thresh it and, uh, and then you've gotta winnow it. So in all of that, it takes two days for a third of an acre. So how much wheat is a third of an acre? Uh, well, that's about 15 bushels. And how much, uh, how much you know, wheat is, uh, you know, how much bread can be produced from 15 bushels? It's 640, I think it was 640 uh, pound and a half loaves of bread. So that's pretty amazing. Really in two days, it's not just one day, one day to, to harvest, to reap, and the other day to thresh and winnow, um, you can produce 640 standard size loaves of bread. Pretty impressive for a person. Then I thought, what does a tractor, what does a guy do who's harvesting and he's just one guy in the combine and he's driving it? How much can he do with a combine so by the way, you know, we, we see the sickle. I want to show you the combine. This is the John Deere X9-1100. And there's two of them here, but I'm just asking for one person what they were doing. So this is state of the art. These came out, I think, in 19, or 2019 or 2020. So the X9-1100 will cut, thrash, and winnow. Um, not a third of an acre in two days, but 30 acres in an hour. In an hour. In two days, that's not 15 bushels that it will produce. In two days, it'll produce... 22,560 bushels of wheat, enough to make not 630 loaves of bread, but over 1 million loaves of bread. The same guy doing it by himself with a hand sickle or doing it behind the steering wheel or whatever they have of a John Deere X9 1100. And here's my question for you. When you look at the sickle and the X9 1100, which are you going to be? Are you gonna be the person who is going to try to do life by yourself without calling upon the power of the Holy Spirit? You're gonna be a Christian, but you're gonna do it all by yourself. You don't need the Holy Spirit. Are you gonna be somebody who says, Holy Spirit, please empower me, fill me, use me, minister through me. And my hope and prayer is you're gonna be the person who wants to get behind the combine of the Holy Spirit's power to allow you to be his witnesses, to allow you to live life for him, to live as a child of God, to see his strength, his grace, his leading in your life. If that's what you'd like to do, I'd like to invite you to put your hands like this on your lap and I want us to pray together. Would you bow in prayer with me? And would you just whisper these words under your breath? Spirit of the living God, fill me with your power. Form and shape me. Mold and make me. Guide and lead me. Help me to know I belong to you. Help me to pay attention to your promptings, to listen for your voice. I surrender myself to you. Fill me, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to invite you to do that every single day to every morning, start your day and invite the Holy Spirit to work in you and then pray that you might have the ears to hear what the Holy Spirit's saying and then you might have the courage to do whatever it is God's calling you to do and you're gonna find that you'll live into the life that God intended for you. At this time, we move to our offering and I'd like to invite you, if you'd like to participate in our offering, this is one way of, of giving thanks to God. It's, it's a way of saying, thank you, Lord, for everything you've given to me and you give a portion back. That's how the farmers did it throughout the Bible. They gave their first portions of their harvest to God. And, uh, and so this is a chance for you to do that here. If you have your own church family, give to your church first. And then if you wanna participate in our offering, that's awesome, we'd love to, we'd, we'd welcome that. When you give to Church of the Resurrection, if this is your church family, you give to the church, you make possible all of the ministries of this congregation in Kansas City, across the country, and around the world. This week, you're gonna be making possible Vacation Bible Camp for 1,200 children. How awesome is that? So I'd like to invite you, you can give in a couple of ways. You can always send a check to the church, but you can also give using your cell phone. You can text to the number 77977, and you can text the message COR. So text COR for Church of Resurrection to 77977. Uh, send that. You'll get a link back. Click on the link and you can give in that way. Or you can go to core.org slash next and you can give there as well. We invite you to listen now carefully to God's word and song as we share together in the offering.
It's been such a joy to worship God with you today. Thank you for being here. I want to encourage you to be back next week. Next week, uh, the sermon ends with us removing the tractor, my tractor from the chancel. Some of you have asked, how did you get that up there? How are you going to get it off? Come next week and you'll find out. You can join us online and you'll be able to see it online or on TV. But if you really want to see it, join us at 9 or 11 here in the sanctuary at the Leewood location if you're, you know, live in the Kansas City area because you're gonna watch us do it live in the room. I don't want you to miss it. It's a pretty dramatic and kind of fun thing. And it actually is, the, is what's driving home the point of the entire sermon series. So don't miss next week, whether it's on TV, online, at one of our locations, or here at the Leewood location in Kansas City. A few other announcements. If you're a guy, I'd like to invite you to be a part of our men's retreat at Table Rock Lake, August 26th through the 28th. This is at a resort style campground. Uh, it's gonna be awesome, a chance to decompress, hang out with other guys, build new friendships and grow in your faith. And, uh, and it's gonna be led by three of our pastors, uh, Pastor Joshua Clough at our Overland Park location, Pastor Bill Gepford at our West location, and Pastor Matt Beisel, who oversees all of our adult discipleship. It's gonna be awesome. It's 150 bucks and it's gonna be well worth your time to be able to do that. I promise you, you're gonna come away refreshed, renewed, and having had a lot of fun with a bunch of guys maybe you don't even know. But you can sign up at cor.org slash next to be a part of the men's retreat coming up the end of August. Uh, I want to invite you to be a part of our survey. We are taking a survey of people who attend Church of the Resurrection um, about faith and abortion. So I've got an event coming up the end of, uh, we've got an event coming up the end of July uh, to talk about this conversation of faith and abortion. But in preparation for that, I'm inviting you to take a survey, men and women to take a survey and to share with us your thoughts. And so the survey takes about 10 minutes. You can find the survey at cor.org slash next. And there'll be more information about the event coming up at the end of July. But mostly right now, I wanna encourage you to take the survey and I'm gonna be sharing your results at the end of the event in, uh, at the end of this month. And, uh, and finally, I wanna remind you, we have Vacation Bible Camp t taking place this week. We have about 1,200 children, 300 adults who are going through uh, studying four basic passages of scripture. They're gonna be talking about what does it mean to be a hero in Christ? And that theme is gonna be carried through into next week's message. So what I wanna ask you to do is would you pray for our children and pray for those who are working with them, that this will be a powerful week for children to grow in their faith and that they will actually come to know the Holy Spirit's work in their lives and that they might live in the power of the Holy Spirit. With that in mind, I invite you to bow with me for our closing prayer. Oh God, thank you for this day. Thank you for your love. Thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit. Fill us, Holy Spirit, we pray, and help us to walk in your power every day. And we pray for our children, our youth, our adults who are working with or participating in Vacation Bible Camp this week. Pour out your spirit on each of them. Help them to grow deeper in their faith and their love for you and to walk in your power. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us in worship today. We're so glad that you're here and we hope that you encountered God in this time. I wanna remind you that if you haven't already gone to quarter slash next, go there, tell us you're here, register your attendance. Also submit any prayer requests that you have. We would love, to, we have a whole team um, who would love to be praying with you, whether it's a joy or concern, uh, anything going on in your life, we would love for you to do that as well. There's all sorts of things that you can find out at core.org slash next, uh, including these great upcoming online uh, chats and forums where you can gather together. Uh, go to our online Facebook page as well. Uh, that'll be a great place for you to find out what's coming next and uh, in ways to get engaged. We also want to remind you about our event on the 27th, where we're having a conversation uh, in, uh, about the intersection between faith and, and abortion and, and this conversation in, in response to the Supreme Court's uh, recent ruling. The last thing we'd share is that we have this awesome upcoming retreat for uh, men. So if you're interested in going to Table Rock Lake uh, to have this great experience with other guys over the course of the weekend, we'd love for you to sign up for that as well. Uh, Ashley, you asked I me. I think one more thing. If you stayed on this long, you deserve <laughs> this treat. I asked you a question. You did. You asked me a question. On. I was reluctant to answer because I want to make friends, not enemies. But if you're asking me like one, one of my favorite go-to places are in, in Kansas, Kansas City. City. It's, uh, it's this little small restaurant in Westport. It's called Pot Pie. And, uh, and they serve like chicken pot pies or beef pot pies and total comfort food. They don't have menus. They have a chalkboard. They have like really comfortable tables and it's just a great place to get a good and meal. And it's about the size of a Tic Tac, right? It's very small. It's really small. Yeah. Postage stamp kind of restaurant. All right. Just well, now place. we have a new recommendation. We'll check yep. it out. It's going to be a great one. Uh, <laughs> that's more than you ever wanted to know uh, at, by tuning into worship. <laughs> We hope to see you again next week. We're going to be wearing capes because we're going to be celebrating uh, Hero University BBC. So come and join us as we conclude our series of sermons on God and tractors, the summer revival uh, next weekend. Take care. <laughs>